So it's an honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Stankiewicz, who is a Harvard-trained ear and skull-based surgeon and also an MIT-trained auditory neuroscientist. Uh, she holds the Sheldon and Dorothy Buckler Chair in Otolaryngology at Mass Eye and Ear Infirmary, uh, which is a teaching hospital of Harvard Medical School. Uh, in addition to her clinical duty, she directs a basic science lab focusing on diagnostics and therapeutics of sensory neural hearing loss, combining biotechnology with molecular biology. Most exciting, uh, she'll be moving to Palo Alto in June of 2021 to be the next chair of the Department of Otolaryngology at Stanford. And of course, we uh, also like to say that she is a friend and colleague, and so we're very privileged and honored to have her here give us a lecture uh, so Dr. Stankowitz, please go right ahead. Thank you so much, Bill. I'm uh, indeed delighted to have an opportunity to tell you about our ongoing work to define molecular determinants of hearing loss in uh, vestibular schwannoma. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. So for me, this journey began when I was a neurotology fellow and we would repeatedly see uh, patients like this in clinic uh, that illustrate the conundrum. And basically you see on top a sizable vestibular schwannoma that did not cause any hearing loss. This was an incidental discovery. And at the bottom, you see a much smaller vestibular schwannoma, which was associated with a dramatic drop in hearing, especially in word recognition, which was only 8%. So examples like this, and we have all seen many of them, tell us that it cannot be just tumor size that's determining the degree of hearing loss and mechanical compression of the auditory nerve, which begs the question of what else is then contributing to the tumor-induced hearing loss. And some insights come from studying cadavers. Uh, because, as we all know, the only source of information about the cellular basis of human deafness comes from studying autopsy specimens. And this is a temporal bone of a patient with actually a relatively small vestibular schwannoma, which you can see here, but it did cause some pathology in the inner ear, not only in the vestibule with some endolymphatic high drops, but also in the cochlea. Although the cochlea here looks pristine, if you zoom in and actually look at the organ of Cordy, you will see that it's flat. All hair cells are gone. And there are, of course, more dramatic uh, examples of cochlear pathology in patients with vestibular schwannoma. And here in this example, we can see a dramatic loss of spiral ganglion neurons and serial atrophy, and again, loss of uh, integrity of the organ of Cordy. And there is this proteinaceous precipitate in paralymph. And uh, it's this proteinaceous precipitate that actually uh, was the impetus for diagnostic testing uh, that was available before MRI scans became routine, which was um, paralymph biopsy to distinguish uh, a vestibular schwannoma from and lymphatic hydrops due to Meniere's disease. Um, so now, uh, if we actually quantify the degree of cochlear pathology in patients with vestibular schwannoma, it's impressive because nearly 90% of patients have loss of outer hair cells. So that uh, has prompted us to start investigating other potential contributors to vestibular schwannoma-induced hearing loss in addition to tumor size. And when I was a fellow, we began looking at molecular differences between tumors that cause hearing loss versus those that don't. And this is a heat map where each column represents a different sample and each row uh, represents a different gene. And you can clearly see that the two sides of the uh, heat map are different, meaning that tumors associated with poor hearing seem different than those associated with uh, good hearing at a molecular level. But this was a small study, and it was uh, uh, not big enough to accomplish statistical significance for individual genes, which led us to uh, employ a different technique, and this was a PhD work of a then graduate student, Andrew Lysett, to collect human paralymph during indicated uh, vestibular schwannoma resections and compare it with 
uh, perilin from patients undergoing cochlear implantation. Again, the tumor size was, uh, sorry, the sample size was small, but nonetheless, it allowed us to uh, define some proteins that were differentially expressed in paralympho patients with vestibular schwannoma compared to those uh, who did not have a tumor. Now, uh, intrigued by these findings, we decided to use a more definitive approach and focus on a smaller number of uh, molecules of interest so that we could uh, achieve statistical significance. So our hypothesis has been is that tumor secretions of proteins with ototoxic potential influences hearing status in vestibular schwannoma patients. And this was a PhD work of a then graduate student, Sonam Dilwali. And basically we collected human tumor samples and stratify them by hearing. Uh, into those associated with good hearing, which is defined as word recognition better than 70% and pure tone average less than 30 decibel, and those with poor hearing. And as a control, we use the great auricular nerve, which is routinely cut during some um, neck dissections and parotidectomies. We then incubated these um, surgical samples in uh, normal saline and then collected the, this conditioned uh, saline and analyzed it using a cytokine array. And then we validated the findings using a different uh, tool, which was an ELISA kit. Um, and to our surprise, we identified a protein which actually was associated with better hearing in vestibular schwannoma patients. We set up the assay to identify the bad guys, the molecules that could be promoting or contributing to hearing loss associated with these tumors, but our cytokine array also included a fibroblast growth factor too, and that was actually the only molecule that was statistically significantly different between the tumors associated with good and poor hearing, and that finding was validated using a different um, technique, namely ELISA, and a different uh, uh, set of patient samples. So then when we plotted FGF levels as a function of pure tone average or word recognition, we again see that there is a statistically significant difference with FGF2 levels being uh, secreted at higher levels by tumors that do not cause hearing loss. And that is very interesting because FGF2 had previously been implicated in protecting the inner ear from both noise-induced hearing loss and glutamate neurotoxicity, as well as neomycin ototoxicity. So here we have a growth factor, which by definition is a mitogen and it makes tumors grow. And at the same time, it could be protecting the inner ear. So this may explain why we sometimes see relatively large tumors that do not cause any hearing loss. But we have really pursued on the quest to identify the bad guys. And um, this is, but we had to first establish a method to test for their potential to cause direct cochlear damage. Because ideally, of course, we would want to routinely sample paralympha in these patients with vestibular schwannoma, but that's not yet uh, routinely possible. So we established a model uh, where we used a mouse cochlear explant, and here hair cells are shown in green and nerve fibers are shown in red. And then we collected um, vestibular schwannoma secretions. Basically now we used uh, tumor samples and put them in, condition, in, in media, culture media, and then we con collected condition media and applied it to mouse cochlear explants. And here we can be very quantitative because we can define the number of um, lost hair cells and um, neurites and the severity of fiber disorganization. So when we did that, we now decided to focus on a single molecule. And we uh, zoomed in on tumor necrosis factor alpha because it had been uh, detected at elevated levels in patients with two other types of human hearing loss, namely patients with 
sudden idiopathic sensory neural hearing loss and autoimmune inner ear disease. And interestingly, commercially available and FDA approved TNF alpha antibody uh, improved or stabilized hearing loss due to autoimmune inner ear disease. So when we now looked at our tumor condition media, uh, we found that uh, there was now a correlation between TNF alpha levels and the severity of hearing loss when looked at both in terms of pure tone average and word recognition. And this was statistically significant. And prior to that, we analyzed TNF alpha expression in the tumors, both at the gene and at the protein level, and, and again, found it to be elevated compared to the control great auricular nerves. So now this is a correlation, but how do we prove causation? And to do that, we um, again used our cochlear explant model, and I'm showing you three uh, different columns. The, the one in the middle is the cochlear explants that were treated with uh, condition media from a patient who had normal hearing prior to surgery. And contrast that with the uh, explants treated with condition media from a patient who had poor hearing uh, at the time of surgery, basically complete anacusis. And you can see the, a dramatic loss of both hair cells and nerve fibers, indicating that there is something in these, um, uh, in the condition media that's uh, allowing this damage to occur. And of course, a very important control was uh, to treat these mouse cochlear explants with condition media from a normal, healthy, human nerve because we had to prove that we are not seeing these effects because we are mixing species, namely human tumor secretions and mouse um, explants. So now that we see this, the question is what is contributing to this damage? So zooming in on TNF-alpha, we blocked TNF-alpha in tumor secretions using a neutralizing antibody, and then we see a lot less damage which now establishes that TNF-alpha is an ototoxic molecule in vestibular schwannoma-associated hearing loss. That uh, led us to uh, survey the literature and analyze the role of TNF-alpha in hearing loss in general and then in vestibular schwannoma in particular. And uh, it prompted the next series of experiments which were recently published where we a perfuse the guinea pig inner ear with TNF alpha because our question is how is it causing this damage? This, this was a series of technically very difficult experiments performed by a then a fellow uh, Ilhan Sahin. And the first step was to prove that his technique was meticulous, namely that when he perfused the guinea pig cochlea with artificial paralymph, that he did not cause any change in hearing. And that is indeed shown in these uh, plots where on the top we see the compound action potential of the auditory nerve. And uh, at the bottom we see distortion product autoacoustic emissions, which of course reflect out of hair cell function. And now having established that baseline, he then perfused the guinea pig cochlea with TNF alpha and we see a trend towards slight elevation in thresholds uh, for the compound action potential, but these uh, were not statistically significant and there was no change in autoacoustic emissions. Well, there is a much more sensitive metric to look at a potential uh, neurotoxic damage and that's to look at the amplitude of the compound action potential, not the threshold itself, because threshold measures in general are quite insensitive. It turns out that you can have 90% of auditory nerve fibers gone and threshold responses will remain intact. So now if we look at the amplitude of the compound action potential, uh, which is a proxy for um, wave one amplitude of the auditory brainstem evoked response, we see that uh, guinea pigs perfused with TNF-alpha 
had a statistically significant drop in their amplitude of uh, the compound action potential. And this could be prevented by giving the animal a, a tanercept, which is a TNF alpha blocker uh, prior to intracochlearly perfusing it with TNF alpha. So this is certainly exciting because it tells us that TNF alpha can cause uh, cochlear, direct cochlear damage, and it seems like it's neuropathic or synaptopathic based on this drop in the compound action potential amplitude. So to look at that histologically, we uh, immunostained synapses in the inner ear using a marker for a presynaptic ribbon in outer hair cells and a postsynaptic density in uh, cochlear afferents that synapse on them. And we can see that uh, there are many more of these, we call them orphan synapses. You see on these pictures uh, on the far left, there are green and red dots and there are lots of pairs because all of these synaptic uh, endings are paired. However, in the TNF alpha perfused animal, there are many more uh, missing synapses, namely there are these orphan synapses. And when we quantify that along the length of the cochlea, this was statistically significant across the length of the cochlea. And again, it could be prevented by giving a tanercept. And this quantification was done by uh, then two um, research fellows Sachi Katsumi and um, Becky Lewis. So now that we know that TNF alpha is a culprit, can we design a molecular therapy that specifically targets abnormally elevated TNF alpha levels in the tumor and avoid systemic side effects? I told you that uh, TNF alpha inhibitors are widely used in rheumatology to treat all sorts of uh, autoimmune diseases and uh, arthritis. However, they are typically given systemically and they can cause uh, wide ranging side effects. So we decided to design nanoparticles that would inside them carry um, silencing RNA for the TNF alpha gene. And this was a work of a then uh, resident, Yin Ren, and he designed these nanoparticles that had three parts, the tumor targeting domain, uh, the cell penetrating domain, and the membrane targeting domain. And uh, allowing these uh, peptides to self-assemble, he was then able to fill them with um, siRNA for TNF alpha. But the first step was to uh, make sure that our uh, vestibular schwannoma cells express the receptor for the tumor targeting ligand, IRGD. And indeed, uh, we show that in primary human vestibular schwannoma cultures, they do express the receptors, both the integrin and um, neurophilin. And uh, the, ne the next step was to look at the expression of these receptors in the human vestibular schwannoma tissue. And you see a lot more green here showing that these receptors are selectively upregulated in the tumor tissue and are absent for the great auricular nerve and other healthy tissues. So then the next step was to apply these nanoparticles packaged with um, siRNA uh, that silences TNF alpha uh, and apply them to both um, human vestibular schwannoma cells that were immortalized. And here we are using the HAI-193 cell line. And we also in parallel apply them to primary human vestibular schwannoma cells. And you can see that in both cases, there are lots of these bright dots inside of cells. And each one of these bright dots is a nanoparticle that was taken up by these cells. And as a result, we saw a dramatic decrease in TNF alpha um, expression, both at the gene and protein level. And this opens up a new direction for future therapeutics that are actually molecular therapeutics targeted to specifically address the tumor tissue while avoiding healthy tissues. Uh, so 
let's take a further step, a deeper dive into this TNF alpha mechanism. And what are the downstream regulators uh, that are affected by TNF alpha signaling? And this schematic at the bottom shows you that when TNF alpha binds to its receptor, it stimulates a, cas a signaling cascade that involves NF kappa B. That's a nuclear factor kappa B, which is a transcription factor that controls many genes, including pro inflammatory genes. And when it's activated, then NF-kappa B translocates from the cytoplasm into the nucleus. So first, Sonam quantified the degree of um, expression, gene expression of a number of genes involved in both canonical and non-canonical NF-kappa B signaling and found them to be elevated in vestibular schwannoma tissue compared to the nerve. And as the next step, we showed the same thing at the protein level, where now we are immunostaining either healthy human nerve on the top or the vestibular schwannoma tissue at the bottom. And we are uh, immunostaining a component of NF-kappa B uh, complex, which is called P50. And you can see that in the normal nerve, you see a lot of red cytoplasmically located, but in the tumor tissue, you see little red dots within the blue nuclei, which means that now the NF-kappa B has translocated into the nucleus. So now it can affect transcription of downstream genes. And so that then begs the question of what if we target NF-kappa B? Can that be therapeutic? And to do that, we used uh, a culture of both primary human vestibular schwannoma cells as well as primary human Schwann cells. And then we treated it with two different NF-kappa B inhibitors. We used a molecular inhibitor, which is a siRNA targeting NF-kappa B, or a pharmacologic inhibitor, Bay 11 or a spice, curcumin, which is derived from turmeric. And then uh, the, this is relevant for multiple reasons. One, because by using these different inhibitors, we are targeting different parts of the signaling pathway as shown here. And two, uh, this opens up future possibilities to try a variety of different approaches to try to inhibit tumor growth and hopefully preserve hearing. And we used the key, uh, two key outcome assays, which was proliferation rate and cell death. And basically, we found that all three inhibitors of NF-kappa B caused a decrease in the proliferation rate of primary human vestibular schwannoma cells. So that uh, coupled with the fact that two of these inhibitors, namely Bay 11 and curcumin, also led to a reduced survival of these tumor cells has now stimulated some of our patients to start taking curcumin on their own to inhibit tumor growth. Uh, I always tell patients that uh, we haven't done the definitive study. We haven't done a prospective randomized double-blind clinical study to know whether this really works or not. But some patients tell me these anecdotal reports that, that it's only after they started taking uh, curcumin that they saw their uh, tumor growth stop. I think it's a really exciting uh, possibility to pursue in the future. And it's interesting because curcumin is already used in more than 40 clinical trials uh, for all sorts of um, diseases, including neoplasms. So now, uh, how does this targeted approach fit into a big picture omic approach, because I told you that we decided to zoom in on TNF-alpha after having done uh, large-scale omic studies before that were limited in sample size. So here we performed the largest meta-analysis of vestibular schwannoma transcriptome by pooling uh, published data, and this is the a PhD thesis of a then graduate student, Jessica Sagers, and uh, we use this meta-analysis to identify genes that are commonly and concordantly up or down regulated in vestibular schwannoma. Uh, 
when we then analyzed these genes using pathway analysis, it was really striking that neuroinflammation was the top ranking pathway. And this was reassuring to us because a couple of years prior, we did a different analysis that was based on critical review of pathobiology where we um, analyzed all studies that were focused on human tissue and had relevant controls and explicitly described statistical criteria. <clears throat> and again, we found that inflammation was the top ranking pathway. So that uh, led us to investigate retrospectively a few years ago whether it's possible that a quintessential anti-inflammatory medication, namely aspirin, could prevent these tumors from growing. And we saw a, a um, significant difference in patients who took aspirin for unrelated causes uh, in that they, their tumors were less likely to grow and this panned out for both linear and volumetric analysis. However, several other groups since then have performed the same analysis and did not see this trend. So that uh, led us to further look at whether this drug could actually have a direct effect on tumor cells. And we uh, used the, by now familiar to you, uh, primary vestibular schwannoma culture system and primary human Schwann cell culture system. And we treated it with different salicylates, namely aspirin, sodium salicylate, um, which is often used to treat inflammatory bowel disease and 5-aminosalicylic acid, which is used in uh, patients with allergy to aspirin. And then we assayed a variety of different outcomes, including proliferation rate using the BRD USA, the cell death, looking at apoptosis. We uh, quantified the level of prostaglandins in culture media because prostaglandins are released when COX enzyme is activated. And it's COX enzyme that's really inhibited by aspirin. And finally, we looked at the uh, calorimetric uh, cell viability assay. And when we used aspirin in all of these conditions, we indeed found that it was effective. But prior to that, we quantified the degree of pro prostaglandin uh, synthase II gene expression in tumor tissue and found it to be elevated as well as in um, primary vestibular schwannoma cultures. And in addition to the gene expression, we also found that at the protein level, COX-2 here uh, shown in green was highly upregulated in human tumor tissue compared to um, healthy human nerve controls. And there was a correlation between uh, the proliferation rate in primary human vestibular, vestibular schwannoma cultures and the levels of prostaglandins in culture media. So uh, the next step then was to apply uh, all of these salicylates to these cultured cells. And the bottom line is that we found that all three salicylates inhibited vestibular schwannoma proliferation in culture in a dose-dependent manner, and they did not cause uh, uh, increased cell death. So basically what that implies is that this drug could be cytostatic, but it's not cytotoxic for vestibular schwannoma. And at least a part of the uh, therapeutic effect has to do with inhibition of prostaglandin secretion. So all of these data combined have motivated us to uh, initiate a prospective randomized double-blind placebo-controlled phase two clinical trial of aspirin for vestibular schwannoma. And in this study, patients are randomized into whether they receive aspirin or placebo. And if they receive aspirin, it's actually a much larger dose than what you would use over the counter. They are getting 325 milligrams twice a day. Uh, and we came up with this dose when we extrapolated from the dose that was required in vitro to prevent these tumor cells from growing. Uh, so, uh, and that informed what may be relevant in vivo. 
And then if tumor grows, and we are defining tumor growth as 20% change in tumor volume, then they can be uh, crossed over to the treatment arm if they were taking placebo before. Uh, because we are aiming to recruit a large number of patients, uh, we are now including eight institutions uh, to get large enough numbers. So in addition to Mass Ioneer and Mass General Hospital, uh, Stanford, Mayo Clinic, the University of Iowa, the University of Utah included, and the newest members are the University of Miami and Barrow Neurological Institute. And of course, if you guys at the House Ear Clinic are interested, we would love to have you on board as well. Uh, so now, if we are talking about giving people this dose of aspirin, basically 600 milligrams daily for three years, this begs the question, is this safe? Because as we all know, uh, aspirin has been linked with increased risk of tinnitus. And in fact, in animal models, mega doses of aspirin are used to induce tinnitus. But in humans, this, these side effects start happening when you're using 2000 milligrams. Uh, and that's, uh, a much, that's more than three times the dose that we are using. So from that standpoint, we think we are safe, but in parallel, we completed um, prospective epidemiologic study in collaboration with Gary Curhan uh, at the School of Public Health and a then graduate student, Brian Lynn, uh, sorry, a then resident, uh, Brian Lynn. And this involved more than 54,000 female participants in the nurses health study. Uh, which amounted to nearly 730,000 person years of follow-up time. And basically we found that regular use of aspirin and regular use is defined as being used at uh, least three times per week was not associated with an increased risk of hearing loss. However, regular use of ibuprofen uh, and acetaminophen was associated with a statistically significant risk of hearing loss. So that tells us that from the standpoint of our study, we should be safe. And at the same time, it tells us that ibuprofen and acetaminophen and their regular use are two major modifiable risk factors for hearing loss. So in addition to the uh, TNF-alpha related and NF-kappa B signaling that we have discussed, what are other inflammatory pathways that could play a role? And here we decided to zoom in on inflammasome, which describes a multi-protein uh, intracellular complex, which serves as a sensor of what uh, the cell is sensing on the outside. And we decided to focus on NLRP3 inflammasome because this mutations in the NLRP3 gene have been shown to cause both syndromic and non-syndromic hearing loss in humans. And uh, there, there have been studies shown in animal models showing pathologic um, NLRP3 inflammasome activation in age-related hearing loss. So we looked at human vestibular schwannoma tissue stratified by hearing. And uh, you can see the distribution of word recognition as a function of pure tone average. And when we look at these vestibular schwannomas, we find that overall they express inflammasome related genes at much higher levels than the control nerve. And there is an additional tendency to an even higher expression in um, tumors associated with poor hearing. So this was then performed at the gene level. And the next step was to validate these findings at the protein level. And for that, we used a different uh, a subset of the tumors plus some additional ones. And we uh, looked at them contrasting good hearing uh, in the left column with poor hearing in the right column. And these are representative examples. And what you can appreciate is that expression of the CD68 uh, macrophage marker was present in all of tumors associated with poor hearing. And uh, interleukin-1 beta, which is a pro-inflammatory cytokines released when inflammasome was activated, was 
present in uh, nine out of 11 poor hearing tumors. And uh, similarly, NLRP3 inflammasome uh, activation was found in nine out of 11 poor hearing tumors. So taken together, this tells us that pathologic in, uh, activation of inflammasome in vestibular schwannoma tissue is associated with poor hearing when controlling for uh, age, sex, and tumor size. And now, can we exploit this therapeutically? Uh, so this is a collaborative work with uh, Gary T um, Brenner at Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, where we looked at an inflammasome uh, related gene, which is called apoptosis associated spec like protein, which is a key adapter that leads to inflammasome activation. And we found that it's actually uh, a schwannoma tumor suppressor. So that tells you that, like anything in biology, there is always yin yang. Some molecules can have a good or bad effects depending on their ligands and downstream signaling molecules that get activated. So thus far, I've told you about inflammasome activation being potentially uh, bad in the sense that it's contributing towards hearing loss. However, here we're exploiting a molecule, a related molecule to deliver gene therapy specifically to schwannoma cells. And when uh, in these experiments were done in mice and they had a uh, schwannoma uh, grown on their sciatic nerve and we delivered directly into the schwannoma, the uh, gene therapy, uh, including uh, AAV1 viral vector that under control of the P0 promoter that's uh, expressed in Schwann cells expresses this ASK um, gene, and we found a dramatic reduction in the growth of these tumors compared to either the um, empty viral vector, which is a control, or injection with saline. So then this really uh, sets the stage for possible future gene therapy that would deliver uh, uh, basically uh, death-causing uh, gene to these tumors. So now let's switch gears a little bit. Thus far, we've talked about uh, specific molecules and we have zoomed in on inflammation as uh, clearly showing a key uh, role in mediating tumor-induced hearing loss. But in addition to molecules that these tumors secrete, uh, we have shown that they can also secrete extracellular vesicles. And this is a work of a then PhD student, uh, Vitor Soares. And uh, this is actually a fascinating topic because extracellular vesicles are really remarkable. Uh, they are produced by uh, virtually every cell in the body. And within them, they can package uh, the molecular cargo that uh, tells you about the identity of their cell of origin. And basically, in these uh, extracellular vesicles, they can package um, messenger RNA and micro RNAs and proteins that can then be delivered to the recipient cells. So these little extracellular vesicles can act like viruses in a way. And they are thought to mediate uh, metastases uh, because they can reach distant places. And now you can see how a tumor could set up shop somewhere else. So basically, uh, Vitor was uh, the first to isolate extracellular vesicles from vestibular schwannoma. And he isolated them from human tumor samples associated with good hearing versus human tumor samples associated with poor hearing. And then when he applied these uh, extracellular vesicles directly to the mouse cochlear explant culture model that you are familiar with by now, we saw that there was more damage when extracellular vesicles from tumors associated with poor hearing were applied to the explants. And this panned out quantitatively. So this tells us that there is something in these extracellular vesicles that's mediating that damage. 
We still don't know what that is. That's an ongoing um, research. However, in the meantime, we wanted to figure out, is it possible that these extracellular vesicles can deliver their cargo directly to the recipient cells? So for that, we used a, a cell culture model where on the top, we are growing spiral ganglion cells from a mouse and we are applying directly to that culture extracellular vesicles that were uh, labeled with a dye that uh, allows us to see them. Or we have used a trans well culture system where at the, at the bottom well, we are growing spiral ganglion cells. And at the, at the top well, we are growing uh, human vestibular schwannoma cells. So now whatever they secrete can get through a tiny um, filter uh, and affect them. So when we do that in either scenario, we can now uh, zoom in on individual spiral ganglion cells and you can see these little green dots, which means that these extracellular vesicles were taken up by spiral ganglion neurons. And the more time goes on, the more of these extracellular vesicles are taken up as shown here. So now we know that these extracellular vesicles can be taken up, but can they deliver their cargo? To address that question, we now used a plasmid expressing a green fluorescent protein, and we uh, transfected human uh, HGI-193 cells, and then we isolated extracellular vesicles secreted by these cells. So if these extracellular vesicles now include mRNA encoding for the um, uh, green fluorescent protein, then when we apply these extracellular vesicles to spiral ganglion neurons, these spiral ganglion neurons should turn green if they are capable of translating that mRNA into protein. And indeed, that's what we find. Uh, the images of, individual, of an individual neuron are shown here, where you see that these neurons now express uh, both TUJ, a neuronal marker, and green fluorescent protein. And they express green fluorescent protein because they received the, they translated the messenger RNA from the protein, uh, um, from, from the uh, GFP gene delivered via the um, extracellular vesicles. So uh, that now tells us that in addition to individually secreted molecules, uh, these tumors secrete extracellular vesicles, which can be directly taken up by the recipient cells, which include cells in the inner ear and could modify that, their function that way. So we are, now, we are building the story that uh, uh, secreting molecules contribute towards hearing loss. Well, that begs the question of how about hearing in the contralateral ear? Because if the tumor is secreting molecules, then these molecules may be able to get to the other ear as well, depending on the level of secretion and tumor size. And they could get to the other ear via different ways, including cerebrospinal fluid and blood. So we decided to do a retrospective study of patients treated for vestibular schwannoma uh, over a long period from 94 to 2018. And this was a work of a then research fellow, Sam Early. Uh, so that included 661 patients with unilateral vestibular schwannoma who had sequential audiometry. So this is the largest study to date that tracks long-term bilateral hearing outcomes in patients with vestibular schwannoma. And we, as a control cohort, we use patients uh, from the Mass Ioneer audiology database that had sequential audiometry. And we had three times as many controls as tumor patients. And uh, for our controls, we focused on patients who had no known autologic disease and uh, had normal hearing at baseline in at least one ear. So what we found is that when we look at patients 
who had normal baseline hearing in the vestibular schwannoma affected ear. When we look at them using Kaplan-Meier uh, analysis, and we're using that analysis because it allows us to control for uh, different lengths of follow-up time, we see that uh, in patients with uh, the, the tumor, hearing declines, and we all know that happens. What we have quantified here is how long it takes to reach the endpoint. And we have defined endpoints in different ways. First, we have looked at pure tone average more than 40 decibel using a three tone pure tone average, or in the middle, we are looking at a 40 uh, decibel endpoint for a four point pure tone average. And on the far right, we are looking at word recognition that drops below 78%. And again, as a reminder, all of these patients started with normal hearing at baseline uh, and 100% word recognition. And what this slide illustrates is two things. One is that it takes about 11 years to reach that endpoint in the tumor affected ear. And that for the contralateral ear, uh, it's not really affected in the sense that uh, hearing in the contralateral ear is uh, not statistically significantly different than in the control ears. However, when we look at patients who start out with abnormal hearing in the tumor affected ear, then we do see a statistically significant change showing that the contralateral ear is actually at risk for losing hearing over time. It takes a long time to get there, about 17 years on average. However, is it now does support our hypothesis that these tumors secrete uh, factors that can contribute to hearing loss, not only in the ipsilateral ear, but also in the contralateral ear. And that may affect our practices going forward because uh, sometimes we may want to remove the tumor sooner rather than later if it poses a risk not only for the ipsy ear but for the contra ear as well. Uh, well, how do we really figure out what is happening in living humans? That's the holy grail. Uh, I have showed you uh, different uh, experimental approaches that we have taken to uh, address that question, but the most definitive direct way would be to perform liquid biopsy of the inner ear on a routine basis. This is not a, a trivial thing because uh, we all know that there is very little paralymph in the human inner ear, only about 150 microliters, so the equivalent of about three raindrops of fluid. Uh, but we have been working towards enabling routine liquid biopsy of the inner ear, and we first described the proteome of human paralymph, and then we developed a novel microneedle device for controlled and reliable cochlear liquid biopsy. And here, Sam tested this in human cadavers, and this is a picture of the round window, and you can see that the um, penetration that he performed with this microneedle uh, generated a hole of 250 microns in diameter, so this can readily heal spontaneously, or if we put a little patch of uh, fat or fascia, so that uh, tells us that this could possibly be done routinely and repeatedly. And this microneedle device has two safety features. One is a mechanical safety feature with a step off here that uh, prevents deep penetration and two as an electrical safety feature that uh, tells us when the round window membrane has been penetrated because of a potential difference across the membrane due to the different ionic concentration within paralymph and the uh, bathing fluid within which the, uh, the reference electrode is located. So then what we showed as the next step is the feasibility of detecting molecular biomarkers of hearing loss in as little as half a microliter of fluid. And these were technically uh, extremely challenging experiments that were completed by a team of very talented uh, postdoctoral fellows, Lukas Landeberg, um, Sasha Vasilic, and uh, 
um, Takeshi Fujita, and they did these experiments in mice. And in mice, you have only one microliter of pear lymph total, and that includes cochlear and vestibular pear lymph. So they were able to show that when using um, only half a microliter of cochlear pear lymph, uh, we could detect differences after acoustic trauma in mice. So if we can indeed see uh, significant differences in candidate biomarkers in just half a microliter of pear lymph, that really opens up the possibility for future routine liquid biopsy of the human inner ear. And in addition to uh, then quantifying the levels of the molecules we have discussed thus far, namely TNF-alpha and interleukin-1-beta uh, and FGF2, what are some of the other molecules we would want to be sampling uh, and quantifying when we ultimately start performing routine liquid biopsy of the human inner ear? To address this question, uh, Yin, uh, overlapped two databases, the meta-analysis of vestibular schwannoma transcriptome that I told you about, which we completed, and the human degradome database, which includes over 600 proteases. And proteases are relevant here because proteases degrade the extracellular matrix, and they allow tumors to be very aggressive. We know that the tumor we are dealing with is not a malignancy. However, we all know that some tumors are much stickier than others. Some are very difficult to peel from the facial nerve and facial nerves at risk. Um, some, and, and so what mediates that? What is molecularly different in the tumors that are difficult to micro dissect regardless of their size? So when uh, Yin overlapped these two databases, he identified a series of proteases that were uh, elevated in vestibular schwannoma tissue compared to healthy controls. And he zoomed on one of them, MMP14, matrix metalloproteinase 14, because it was most highly elevated. And then when he quantified its levels, in a number of uh, human vestibular schwannomas compared to the great auricular nerve, he saw a statistically significant difference in levels by ELISA assay. The next step is to validate this finding using immunohistochemistry. And uh, we indeed see that the level of MMP14 expression in these tumors can range from um, no expression to uh, mild, moderate, or severe expression. And overall, we do not see any MMP14 expression in healthy great auricular nerves, which makes this MMP14 a potentially um, adequate biomarker. But more work is needed to figure out whether it's indeed a good biomarker. And the first step along um, uh, that direction was to correlate the levels of MMP14 in patients' plasma in their blood, because that's something that we can do routinely. And we uh, collected a patient's blood at the time of surgery and prior to tumor microdissection. And we see that there is a correlation between plasma MMP14 levels and the levels that we measure in tumor condition media where we remove the tumor and then put it in um, culture media and collect the supernatant. And there is a correlation between MMP14 levels in plasma and the severity of hearing loss uh, measured by either pure tone average or word recognition. Uh, so uh, the next uh, step then was to ask the question of, is it possible that elevated MMP14 levels are associated with more difficult tumor resection? And to do that, we uh, looked at uh, the tumor resections and uh, categorized them as either gross total resection or subtotal resection and overall found that indeed tumors that secrete higher levels of MMP14 uh, were more difficult to dissect and led to subtotal resections. And 
when we now look at the sensitivity and specificity of measuring MMP14 in plasma and measuring its activity, so for that we had to develop a separate assay that quantifies the activity of this enzyme, we found that these new metrics, namely MMP14 levels, were much better predictors of um, the completeness of surgical resection than the traditional measures that include tumor volume or growth rate. So taken together, uh, all of these data suggest that MMP14 may be a relevant biomarker of tumor uh, of the difficulty of tumor resection and um, could be useful uh, prognostically when counseling patients in clinic. And in the meantime, we also wanted to find out whether it may have anything to do with hearing loss. Uh, so for that, we used our uh, cochlear explant uh, culture system and we treated it with physiologically relevant levels of MMP14. So we are applying MMP14 in the uh, nanogram per milliliter range, the same concentrations that we measured in human vestibular schwannoma secretions. And basically what we find is that uh, MMP14 in a dose dependent manner reduces the number of cochlear synapses and spiral ganglion new, uh, neuron fibers consistent with the notion that MMP14 is a neurotoxic molecule that could be mediating hearing loss induced by these tumors. So taken together then, uh, in summary, I've shown you our approach to enable personalized diagnosis and therapy of vestibular schwannoma and associated hearing loss. And we are uh, developing molecular diagnostics that would include uh, sampling of the inner ear as well as sampling of uh, blood from uh, patients with these tumors. And we have touched upon uh, various therapies that our approaches will, will enable, including drugs and small molecules, as well as gene therapy and uh, devices. We did not have time to talk about devices, but that's a topic for another uh, talk sometime in the future. Uh, I would like to thank uh, people in my lab who have contributed to the work I have described and my many collaborators across the globe. And I very much hope that we can add you guys to the list. And um, I am very thankful to the funding agencies that have supported